All right. Welcome to another evening lecture with Francis Tavern Museum. Remember, if you're joining us virtually and you have any questions during the lecture, please leave them in the Q&A box. We will be monitoring the Q&A during the lecture, so don't worry about saving your question to the end. If you are joining us in person, you will be able to ask your questions at the end of the lecture. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Please note that the views of the speakers are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of Sons of the Revolution in the state of New York or its Francis Tavern Museum. Now let me introduce tonight's speaker. Jack Kelly is a journalist, novelist, and historian. He has written a number of books about American history, including Band of Giants, which won the DAR History Medal. He lives and works in New York's Hudson Valley. Today, he will be speaking to us about God Save Benedict Arnold, the true story of America's most hated man. I'm now going to turn it over to Jack Kelly. Thank you very much, Melissa. I wanna thank all the folks here at uh, Francis Tavern. It's a real honor to be able to speak at some place that's so connected to the history of the revolution. And thank you all for coming and uh, everyone for tuning in. Um, Benedict Arnold is probably the best known soldier in the Revolutionary War, other than George Washington himself. And everybody knows Benedict Arnold and everybody that knows him knows one thing about him. I don't have to say what that is because you know what it is. But I wrote the book in order to clarify that there's more to Benedict Arnold than that one thing. And also that it's important to understand Benedict Arnold in order to get the history of the revolution correct. Uh, and I'm gonna give a few examples of that, of how Benedict Arnold has distorted our view of the Revolutionary War uh, because of things that happened in his life. So the, the uh, revolution began on the morning of April 19th, 1775, when the British Redcoats shot and killed eight minute men at Lexington Green, and the enraged Patriots came back and killed more than 70 of the King's soldiers, and the war was on. The day after the news of Lexington ar arrived in New Haven, Connecticut, where, where Benedict Arnold lived and was a very successful merchant and businessman, uh, he marched off to war. He left behind his business. He left behind a family, three young sons, and immediately had this passionate devotion to the American cause. One of the real leaders, one of the people that pushed the cause. Um, three weeks after Lexington, on May 10th, 1775, he captured the most strategic fortification in the 13 colonies, at Fort Ticonderoga in Northern New York on Lake Champlain. And he not only captured the fort, but he, he then on his own initiative with orders from nobody, went up into Canada and captured a British warship that was the only warship that they had on Lake Champlain and thereby secured all of Lake Champlain for the Patriots. So, Was that a, a significant achievement? I think it was because the strategy of the British in the early years of the war was to gain control, if I can point to it here, of the waterway that ran from Montreal down Lake Champlain, Lake George, with a, a, a portage over the Hudson River and all the way down to New York City. That was the superhighway of the colonies. And they figured if they got control of that water corridor, they could split the colonies, isolate New England, and win the war. The obstacle was Fort Ticonderoga, which is pretty much in the middle, and the control that Arnold had gotten of Lake Champlain major achievement in, in the early years of the war. In addition to that, the cannon that they had, uh, excess cannon at Fort Ticonderoga, the following winter, Henry Knox, uh, a 
uh, dragged those cannon on sleds across the entire state of Massachusetts and gave George Washington the opportunity to win his, his first victory of the war by driving the British out of Boston in March of 1776. So that added to the significance of the takeover of Ticonderoga. What do they say in the history books? It's barely a footnote. There's very little attention is given to the capture of Ticonderoga because it was Benedict Arnold. And when the credit is given, it's often given to this man, Ethan Allen. And it's true that Ethan Allen and his Green Mountain Boys did provide the manpower for the takeover of Ticonderoga. The Green Mountain Boys were a, a vigilante group that Allen had gotten up before the war really had nothing to do with the dispute with Britain. Um, but when the excitement was over, the Green Mountain Boys basically went home. And if you look at uh, Ethan Allen's entire record in the Revolutionary War, uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't think I would have named a furniture company after him. <laughs> but they do love him up in Vermont. I know that. But the idea for taking over Ticonderoga was uh, Benedict Arnold. The leadership was Benedict Arnold, and most importantly, the um, initiative to take control of Lake Champlain, as you'll see in a minute, was uh, all Benedict Arnold. He was, a, he was a, a man of the sea, he'd been a sea captain before the war began. So the next question is, do we owe it to Benedict Arnold to, to get the history right? I don't think we do, because Benedict Arnold was a traitor, and there's nothing in my book that in any way uh, exonerates him or uh, diminishes his treason. In fact, I think that the actual um, unfolding of his treason is, was worse than most people think. So it's we don't owe him anything, but we owe it to ourselves to, to get the history right. And um, the problem is that Benedict Arnold is a paradox. He was a hero, and he was a a villain. He was someone who passionately pushed the revolution. He was somebody who tried to destroy the revolution. And it, that's uh, hard to get your mind around. That's uh, in the in the days of Parson Weems. Um, they like to get history simplified. And George Washington can never tell a lie. And Benedict Arnold was nothing but a traitor. So they tend, uh, historians over many, many years, particularly in the 19th century, tended to uh, say that his uh, accomplishments were insignificant, Arnold, or that uh, his participation in them was minimal or his motives were suspect. Um, some of the early biographies said he was a nasty little boy and therefore he must have been a traitor from the cradle. Oh, that makes sense. So if he was always a traitor, then he's a, a simpler character, is um, easier to understand. But history is full of paradoxical people. And even just in the Revolutionary War era, you have Aaron Burr, or Ethan Allen himself, or General uh, uh, Charles Lee. Um, they weren't, they didn't go as far as Benedict Arnold did, but they wavered, or they had their doubts, or they did things that were a little suspect uh, of, of them being true believers. Um, some of the, um, I, I have a book on my shelf called Patriotic Treason. It's not about Benedict Arnold, it's about John Brown. And again, in as history goes along, as pe these people are, par they're paradoxical, they're, they're conflicted, our views of them are conflicted. That's the great thing about history. I think that what is what history should be. And we have to keep looking at the paradoxical people because they can be dangerous. And Benedict Arnold certainly was dangerous. So we come to 1776, and now we see the value of Ticonderoga because the British intend to invade the colonies from Canada. They send 7,000 man army over there and they um, are planning to come down that water corridor, down Lake Champlain, Lake George, and down to the south. Uh, the obstacle, the, the, uh, the, they can't move their army down to try to take T Ticonderoga back because Benedict Arnold has now 
built these gunboats. This is a replica of the gunboat Philadelphia that was uh, built by the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. Um, there was about a 50 foot long boat armed with three cannon. And Benedict Arnold was building those and they, the British troop transports would have been vulnerable to ships like that on Lake Champlain. So they had to beget, begin to build their own warships to protect the troop transports to get the army down to attack Ticonderoga. And that took all summer. It was really, it began an arms race with the British in uh, St. John's up here in Canada, building ships with all the resources of the, of the Royal Navy. And... Uh, Arnold was down in Skeensboro, which is at the very southern tip of Lake Champlain, uh, building mostly gunboats and some slightly larger uh, sailing boats uh, to try to counteract the British uh, firepower. Uh, and that went on all summer. In August, uh, Arnold took his, his very small fleet, what he had gotten finished by that time, up to the north end of Lake Champlain and waited for the British to come down. And he waited and he waited. All through September, no sign of the British. The British were uh, determined to have overwhelming firepower when they came out on that lake. They didn't want to take a chance of, of having a fight where that they would lose. So they kept building more and more ships, even a frigate, which was a, really an ocean going ship, but they, they took one apart, put it back uh, and built, rebuilt it on the, uh, Lake Champlain. Um, Arnold pulled his, um, his fleet back to Valcour Island, which is a little bit farther south, mainly to protect it from the storms that came down Lake Champlain in the fall. And it has a little bay between uh, Valcour Island and the New York shore that he could put the fleet in there and be protected. And he waited longer. October 11th, the, the British finally came down with a very large fleet, much larger even than they, the Patriots had feared uh, of these ships. And um, the uh, Benedict Arnold's second in command said, we gotta get out of here. This is, this is uh, suicidal to stay in this, this trap of this bay. And Arnold said, no, I have a plan. He had a great strategic mind. He was always thinking, always, uh, aware of the circumstances he's involved in. And he uh, said, we're, we're going to fight the Royal Navy and we're going to beat them. And his his strategy was that the this is the American fleet up here. The north end of this, uh, what looks like a strait, it was shallow water, so you, you couldn't approach from the north. The uh, Arnold had figured, well, the British are going to come down. They'll the wait till the wind is from the north, which they did. And then the, the British had to bring sailing ships down, go around the bottom of Alcor Island, and back up into this little bay. And they weren't able to do that with sailing ships because they couldn't tack quickly enough. So the main battle was between the American boats up here, which were at anchor. And Arnold said if, the, if these inexperienced sailors that he had uh, didn't have to sail while they were shooting a cannon. They could just concentrate on shooting. And it went on between the American ships here. And th this represents the British gunboats. They had about 28 gunboats, uh, which was more than the Americans had altogether. And they shot back and forth. Very brutal form of warfare, very bloody. And um, it went on until it got dark, and then the Americans were still standing. The British had not been able to break through that line, but uh, they'd used up three quarters of their ammunition. Uh, they had um, a lot of their boats had been damaged, and now what? So Arnold said, "I have a plan," and he, and he said, "We're going to escape," and the escape from Valcour Bay was almost like a fairy tale in the middle of the night. Very quietly, they slipped through the British blockade down here, got away down the lake. Uh, the fight continued farther south on the lake. Most of the American fleet was destroyed. But the outcome was that by the time the British did finally get their army down to Fort Ticonderoga, it was too late. It was already November. Uh, they were afraid the lake would freeze behind them and they would uh, be stuck there. 
So they decided uh, it was more prudent to go back to Canada and try again in the spring. So the campaign in the North um, in 1776 was a complete success in the sense that it stopped that invasion. Um, was it a sig significant event? All we have to do is look at the other end of the that water corridor in New York City. Uh, in August, George Washington lost the largest battle of the entire war at the Battle of Brooklyn. In September, he was pushed out of New York. Uh, he was later pushed out of the whole island of Manhattan, lost Fort Washington, lost up in White Plains, crossed over to New Jersey, and was pushed all the way across New Jersey. And the, the, all these arrows and stuff are a little complicated, but he ended up here in Pennsylvania, opposite Trenton. Um, his 20,000-man army had shrunk down to 3,000 men. And he wrote a letter to his brother at that point. So this is in December of 1776. And he said, I think the game is pretty near up. And I think it would have been curtains for him if he'd had to worry about a, an invasion coming down the Hudson River from the north. But instead, Benedict Arnold and Horatio Gates, who was in command of Ticonderoga, brought more than 600 men down on ships down to Kingston, New York, and they then marched out and joined Washington's army in Pennsylvania. Some of the men who fought at Valcour Island in October also um, crossed the Delaware with George Washington in his famous Christmas night uh, crossing the Delaware and participated in his greatest achievement, uh, the most spectacular certainly, uh, defeat of the uh, Hessians at Trenton the next day. Benedict Arnold was not one of them because he'd been sent off to Rhode Island on another assignment, but it was his doing that allowed those extra men to come down to uh, to join George Washington. Um, what do the history books say about that campaign? I can't say it's just a footnote because a couple of years ago, a, a book came out called Valcour, the 1776 campaign that saved the cause of liberty, which I wrote myself. It's a pretty good book. Uh, yeah, I recommend it. But um, I, I was surprised when I was researching that book, uh, how little had been written about this campaign. I picked up David McCullough's uh, book, 1776, which many of you probably are familiar with. I'm a great admirer of David McCullough, and I think he's one of our great historians. He didn't um, slight the campaign in the North in this book that was about the events of 1776. He just didn't mention it at all. There's not a single mention of Benedict Arnold or the whole campaign in the North in his book about the year 1776. Again, shows that, that distortion of history, that's, that we don't wanna get near Benedict Arnold. There's sort of something toxic about him. Uh, I don't want him tainting my story, so I, I'm, I'm just gonna leave him out. But it's really a distortion of, of, of what actually happened. So, we move on to 1777. This is Benedict Arnold's house in uh, New Haven. And uh, he had one of the largest houses in town. And he was there uh, on leave. He went uh, after the Valcour campaign. Uh, and usually in the winter, they didn't do much fighting anyway. So he was there on leave. And he decided to resign his commission in the Continental Army. He was fed up because he thought that he deserved a, a promotion after this hard campaign in the North. Uh, George Washington thought he deserved it. Uh, but the promotions were controlled by Congress. And there was a lot of politics. Uh, Benedict Arnold was never very diplomatic or uh, didn't play politics much. So he didn't play the game and get his name pushed forward. And not only did he not get a, a promotion, but he was um, had junior officers promoted over his head. So people who had been his subordinates were now his superiors. And that was a slap in the face to any officer. And he, so he decided to resign. So he wrote out his resignation in July of 1777. He went to Philadelphia and handed it in and he was done with the war. By coincidence, on the same day that he handed his resignation in to Congress, 
Um, the news arrived at Philadelphia that Fort Ticonderoga had fallen to the British. And General John Burgoyne was leading that 7,000 man army, a, a lot of artillery uh, down that water corridor that I spoke of, captured uh, Ticonderoga quite easily now that there was no American fleet to defend it and was on his way towards Albany. Benedict Arnold jumped on a horse. He forgot all about his resignation, rode up to uh, uh, the north, joined Horatio Gates, who was now in command of the army in the north. And together they decided to meet um, Burgoyne at Bemis Heights, which is a high ground a few miles south of the village of Saratoga, which today is called Schuylerville. They fought two battles there, collectively known as the Battle of Saratoga. Um, in both battles, Burgoyne tried to sweep around the left end of the American lines. In both battles, uh, Benedict Arnold was in charge of the left division. In the first battle, he fought Burgoyne to a standstill and inflicted heavy casualties. Uh, that was on September 19th. October 7th, the second battle, he decisively defeated uh, Burgoyne and then personally led a charge um, into the British field fortifications, broke through and put Burgoyne in a, in a position where he had to do what he said he would never do, which was to retreat. Benedict Arnold, who, who is the man on the horse here, um, was severely wounded in that battle. He had a, a bullet shattered his leg bone. Uh, but General Burgoyne, 10 days later, had to surrender his entire army to um, General Gates. So is that a significant achievement? Well, it's the uh, called the turning point of the Revolutionary War. And um, Time Magazine in the year 2000 for the millennium said that the Battle of Saratoga was the single most important battle, most consequential battle fought anywhere in the world in the last thousand years. So it sounds pretty important. So what do they say in the history books? Well, they can't say it's not important, but in every history, just about every history that's been written of the Battle of Saratoga, they have diminished the role of Benedict Arnold. And there was many stories about he was drunk during the battle, or he was pouting in his cabin, or he had been relieved of his command, or he was out on the battlefield, because he must have been on the battlefield because he got wounded. But he was just riding around like a crazy man. He wasn't directing the battle. And these were repeated over and over and over because it was too uncomfortable to, to give him the credit that he deserved for this very, very important battle. And to, just to give an example of how history continues to uh, sort of live as time goes on, this is a letter that was um, discovered in 2016 on eBay. And it was authenticated and was written two days after the, the battle on October 11, uh, October 7th, 1777, by a uh, militiaman from New Hampshire. And he, um, it's sort of a poignant letter, just as a war letter, because he, he says, Dear wife, we arrived here the second day of this instant. I am, through the goodness of God to me, as well as can be expected, our encampment is very little but bushes. I have somewhat of a cold and a bad cough. I hope this finds you and our children all well. He just fought the the, the single most important battle of the last thousand years, and he was reporting to his wife the big news he had a cold. But, you know, it's, it's poignant. This, this was what he was, was his concern. He goes on in the letter to say that he observed uh, General Gates, uh, this uh, Nathaniel Batchelor, who wrote this letter, 
was a an adjutant, so he was in the headquarters, sort of a, a clerk at headquarters, handling paperwork, and he observed General uh, Gates sending out orders to Arnold on the field, uh, warning him against friendly fire. He observed Benedict Arnold come back and talk to Gates, and they talked about sending more troops out during the battle, exactly what you would expect if the two of them were cooperating in a normal fashion uh, uh, to try to win this battle. Nothing about being drunk or staying in his quarters or or being riding around like crazy or any of all the all the stories um, that were um, brooded over the years. Uh, the senior park ranger up at the Saratoga battlefield said that this one letter changed the whole view of the of the uh, Battle of Saratoga. And I think most historians now accept the fact that Benedict Arnold really was the essential man in the essential battle of the Revolutionary War. Three years later, in 1780, we come to the one thing that everybody knows about Benedict Arnold. This was an effigy of Arnold that was dragged through the um, streets of Philadelphia after he went over to the British. And of course, the question is, why did he do it? Um, many reasons have been given over the years, and a lot of historians have their favorite theory. Uh, some say he did it only for the money, and he did get paid a substantial, or he was promised at least, a substantial amount of money from the British. Uh, some say that his wife prompted him to do it. He, he had married Peggy Shippen, who was a young, uh, loyalist-leaning uh, lady from uh, Philadelphia, and she, she had convinced him to go over to the British. Uh, some said that he didn't like the French alliance. That that bothered him. He didn't like being allied with a French the the French. Uh, some said he was never for independence anyway. Some said that it was the con uh, the the promotions and the the mistreatment by Congress that prompted him to do it. Um, my own answer to that question of why why he went over to the British is I don't know, and I think that Benedict Arnold is a is a real uh, enigma. And it's, it's all these things could have been factors, but it's hard to, for me to believe that any one of them could have reversed him so dramatically, 180 degrees. And I've spec, you know, I talk about the factors in the book, but I, and I speculate that I, I admit pure speculation, things like post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, Arnold had been through a, a tremendous amount of stress. He was probably in pain after he got wounded at Saratoga, and it was many, many months laid up trying to recover from that wound. Uh, he was probably in pain for the rest of his life, given the medical uh, uh, capabilities back then. He was probably a narcissist, but you know, again, it's speculation. I don't know why he did it. And I sometimes wonder if he himself could have articulated exactly why he had this tremendous change of heart. But he did. And because he never did anything by halves, he gained control or gained command of the lower Hudson Valley, which was in here, and included West Point. And, and the, at that time, West Point was not a military academy, but was a very important fort. Again, protecting that uh, that water corridor uh, up the Hudson River, and um, the unfolding of this plot, I think, is really one of the great uh, dramas of history um, of, of American history. We find um, on an evening of September 1780, and I can see where it is. Uh, there's a town of Haverstraw, but I can't quite. It's up in this area somewhere here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They met. Uh, he met. Uh, Arnold met there with uh, the head of British intelligence, and that was uh, that was neutral ground. And uh, that was Major John Andre. And they talked all night. Uh, 
Arnold gave uh, Major Andre a, a map of Ticonderoga, showing him where the, they could invade, a uh, list of the troop deployments, other documents. And he told Andre to put the, uh, the documents in his uh, boot, hide them in his boot. Arnold then went home to his uh, headquarters, which was on the east side of the Hudson River, opposite West Point. And Major Andre, um, after some delay, started back to, to the British headquarters in New York on the, um, also on the east side. He'd gone over on the, um, that peak skill was coming down, um, It's hard for me to see this. Oh, no, it's up here. So he was coming down from Peekskill down the east side of the river. And um, he was very um, excited and he was very nervous. He was excited because he'd pulled off the biggest intelligence coup of the war that was going to make his career and probably make his life if it succeeded. And he was nervous because Westchester County um, down in here was uh, no man's land. It was below the American lines, which was up closer to Peekskill, and um, above the British lines down in New York City. And it was patrolled by both um, Patriot and Loyalist militiamen. And sure enough, some men, three men jumped out of the bushes and stopped Andre. And Major Andre um, made the mistake of saying, I hope you're of our party. And uh, they weren't wearing uniforms. Andre was also in civilian clothes. So one of the militiamen said, oh yeah, what party is that? So now uh, Major Andre had to guess. He said, uh, the lower party, meaning the British. The guy said, we're Americans, get down. And they um, searched him. They found the documents. They didn't know exactly what, what was what it was all about, but it was very suspicious that he would have a map of, of West Point in his boot. They took him to their commanding officer. He, he offered them bribes, so they refused the bribes. They took him to their commanding officer, uh, Colonel Jameson, and I think Colonel Jameson was a little slow on the uptake because the first thing he did was to write a letter to his commanding officer, Benedict Arnold, and sent it off by courier. But then he started thinking, and he's like looking over the documents and go, wait a minute, this is Benedict Arnold's handwriting on these on the map and the, these documents, the pass that he had written out for Andre. Uh, he, he said, this is, you know, this is very suspicious. Um, I, I guess he probably, if they'd said it in those days, he would have said, this is above my pay grade. I'm going to send this all to George Washington. So he packed up the, the documents, wrote another letter, sent it by a different courier to George Washington. That's where the plot twist comes in because Washington was not in the American camp at the time. He had been over in Hartford, Connecticut, meeting with French officers, and he was on his way back to camp. And he was scheduled the very next morning to have breakfast with Benedict Arnold at his headquarters. And then they were going to go across and inspect West Point together. So you have the rather tense situation where Arnold, uh, where uh, George Washington is coming down from the north now uh, from the north, and there's two couriers uh, separately are headed towards Arnold's headquarters, um, uh, just uh, opposite West Point, um, because the second courier found out that's where he could find George Washington. Who's going to arrive first? Some of Washington's aides arrived at the headquarters, and they said. The General Washington is just up the road. He'll be here in a minute. Get ready. And he, you know, Washington traveled with a big entourage and guards and everything. Um, then a courier arrived and handed a letter to Benedict Arnold. He read the letter. He told his wife, I got to go. And he 
taught, he said to everybody else, I'm going over to West Point, you know, tell George Washington to, to, to wait here, I'll be back shortly. He ran down to the boat launch, got in a boat on the Hudson River, and told his men to row as fast as they could to the south. Um, George Washington arrived, Arnold's not there. Where is he? Well, he went over to West Point. Okay, Washington says, we'll go over and do the inspection now. Takes the, his entire entourage across the river to West Point. They get over there. The people at West Point haven't seen Benedict Arnold in, in two days. And it was that seems sort of suspicious. Washington started looking around, and the fortifications at West Point, which supposedly were being reconstructed, were falling down. There weren't enough men there. And Washington later described his own thinking at that moment, and he said, my mind misgave me, but I had not the least idea of the real cause. And I think we all understand that feeling. It's like, there's something very wrong here, but I can't put my finger on what it is. So being the imperturbable George Washington, he went back to Arnold's headquarters and decided to take a nap. And before he lay down in bed, another courier arrived, handed him the letter, handed him the documents. Washington immediately saw what was going on. He called in Henry Knox, his most trusted subordinate, and he said, Arnold has betrayed us. Who can we trust now? And it was not a rhetorical question because at that point, Washington did not know who was involved in the plot or um, how far it went. He sent uh, Alexander Hamilton riding down the Hudson River on horseback to try to catch up with Arnold. He sent a message over to the to the army and uh, on the New Jersey border to get as many men marching up to West Point as they could as quickly as possible. And then the real drama began. Uh, Peggy Shippen and now Peggy Arnold, um, and this coincidentally is a portrait of Peggy that was drawn by Major Andre himself when the British were in control of Philadelphia and Peggy was flirting with the British officers and getting her hair done, I guess. And um, she started tearing her clothes off, which was very unusual in those days, and um, screaming, I have to see Washington, they're going to kill my baby. It's, and all the officers gathered around, tried to calm her down. They thought she, she was having a hysterical fit because her husband had been revealed as a traitor and did not suspect that she could be so devious that she was in on the plot all along and was, in fact, trying to help her husband escape and putting on this act. And he did escape. He got down the Hudson River, got onto a ship, British ship, Went down to New York, was made a British, was made a brigadier general in the British Army, fought against Americans for a year before he went over to England and never set foot in America again. Uh, poor Major Andre, this is a self portrait he drew uh, while awaiting trial. And because he was in civilian clothes, uh, he was hanged as a spy a week later. The, the, um, the three, uh, militiamen who um, captured Andre got the silver medals, uh, which prominently had the which prominently had the uh, word fidelity on them. In in contrast to um, Benedict Arnold, and th these were the first military decorations ever given out in American history. And those three men were actually quite famous uh, for a while. Um, a few days after Benedict Arnold's treason was revealed, one of his aides said, um, wouldn't it have been better if the bullet that went through his leg at Saratoga had gone through his heart? And historians have sort of echoed that sentiment down the years and said, if Benedict Arnold had been killed at Saratoga, um, he would be remembered as one of our greatest military heroes. And I think from the the um, accomplishments that I've talked about here this evening, uh, you can see the logic of that idea. 
but I don't think it's true. I think that if uh, Arnold had been killed at Saratoga, he would have been forgotten by the general public, just as Nathaniel Green, Henry Knox, Daniel Morgan, and all the other heroes of the revolution have largely been forgotten uh, uh, by you know people in general. Um, so I'm hoping that um, as we approach the 250th anniversary of the Revolutionary War, there can be some more attention brought to uh, the men who just did the fighting. Um, certainly, we're, we're going to remember Benedict Arnold, but what about all the others? And particularly the men in the ranks who, who fought a very long and very, very brutal and, and hard war in order to create a country, not just fighting for their country, but actually to, to actually create a country. Um, and I would just say in closing that uh, it's my feeling that the, the American Revolution is not over. It's still going on. And each each generation really has a, a an opportunity and a, and a duty to continue pushing the revolution forward. And we can all participate in it by learning about it, by joining in our civic life, and by voting. So thank you very much. Uh, yeah, just if I, I just if anyone wants to, I have a um, on my website, which is jackkellybooks.com. Uh, I have a. Um, uh, mailing list you can sign up on Substack. You get a little some little um, history essays and uh, keep up to what I'm uh, on what I'm doing. So, yeah. Here I put a microphone. So oh, microphone. This around and then Mr. Kelly, if you could repeat the question for everybody. Yeah. Okay. Uh, could you describe Arnold's achievement before Saratoga, in which he could turn St. Legend's forts around and save Fort Stanley? Yeah, the, uh, yeah. The question about is about the, uh, part of the uh, Saratoga campaign, and I think many of us remember from uh, high school the maps showing the the three part campaign that they were going to, and they had sent St. Leisure went out to Oswego, New York, and was coming down the Mohawk River. Uh, they besieged Fort Stanwix or Fort Schuyler, as it was technically called out there in what's now Rome, New York, and. Um, Benedict Arnold did lead a relief uh, force out there. It turned out that the uh, that um, invasion had fallen apart before they got there, so there wasn't all that much fighting. But it did uh, it scared them enough that they went back. So that that was before the Battle of Saratoga. That was part of that campaign. Yeah. Yes. Okay. What. Hey, thank you for a great talk. Um, I was just wondering what your thoughts were on um, after Arnold's succession um, when he wrote his open letter to the American public and the feelings he expressed there. Do you think there's maybe any validity or, I guess, truth in uh, those feelings? Or was he just, I guess, it, it, trying to save his, uh, his legacy? Yeah, that uh, a few days, that it was, you know, or less than a week or so after the uh, his treason was revealed. He published a letter he called "To the Inhabitants of uh, America," and um, he quite a few of the. He didn't mention his wife, of course, but quite a few of the reasons that I get, uh, have uh, talked about uh, the money, the uh, the uh, uh, not liking the French alliance, not liking. He had a whole laundry list of reasons why he had. Um, he thought that the, the the war had gone on too far, that the, the Patriots had gotten everything they could get, going to get, so there was no reason to carry it on. And he went through this whole list of uh, of reasons. None of them were convincing to me. I, they were sounded more like excuses. Most of them were uh, standard uh, loyalist propaganda points that they've been saying all through the war. And um, for example, the French alliance, they said, well, uh, Arnold pointed out that the, what about the king of France? He, you know, he's a tyrant. Uh, they're overthrowing the king of England, but what about the king of France? But everybody knew it was ex an expedient. It was not a, it was not that we're going to, we're going to set up a king uh, similar to the French king here. 
And it turned out that that letter was not written by Arnold. It was written by a uh, the attorney general, the British attorney general of New York um, for Arnold. Supposedly, Arnold suggested what he should say, but I think it was really not his uh, his doing at all. So uh, particularly as it came out so quickly after the afterwards, you know, uh, so I don't really give it much uh, credence. You know, it's just um, it's. Uh, it's another piece of evidence that deepens the mystery. Let's put it that way. I do want yeah. to ask some of the questions from Zoom as well. So we'll okay, yeah. A little bit. So this comes from Sarah. She asks, where are the medals of honor given for the capture of Andre kept now? Well, there's a story behind that, uh, as there is, I guess, uh, everything. Um, two of those medals were on display at the... Um, New York Historical Society until the bicentennial era of uh, the 1970s when they disappeared and they've never been seen again. <clears throat> the, the final one was uh, descended in that family, the Van Wart family, down to a one lady who was the last member of that family and she died with it in a box in her home. Her lawyer found it and he donated it to the um, the uh, State Museum in Albany, where it was on display back in October. And it's going to be on display uh, in Westchester. I'm not sure when, but they're they're mounting an exhibit as the map and the the letters that were found on Andre are also either you can see the actual letters. They don't like to have them out in the light too too much, or replicas of those. So the uh, what happened to those two medals and why somebody would steal them, I, I don't know, but that's a mystery. Wanted to ask you about your view on some of the financial disputes that Arnold had, uh, both in terms of complaining he wasn't appropriately reimbursed, I think, going back to the Quebec campaign, and then issues about how he conducted financial affairs when he was in effect, in military control of Philadelphia after the British left. Yeah, well, uh, he had uh, disputes about money that was owed to him. He laid out his own money to pay his troops and to buy supplies, uh, particularly when they were fighting up in Canada and in the north. Uh, Benedict Arnold, I didn't mention the whole uh, Canadian uh, expedition, which Arnold was involved in, in 1775 uh, into 1776. But the uh, Patriots actually invaded Canada uh, as one of their first uh, operations in the war. So Arnold felt that he was owed uh, to have this money paid back by Congress. He disputed it for years. It was the usual bureaucratic uh, thing. Where are your receipts? Well, he they were in the middle of a war. He didn't write out have receipts for everything. And he got quite disgruntled about that. Um, and then when he was in Philadelphia, he was he was a businessman. His instinct was always like, how can I make money? And the war it wasn't a war situation. He was an administrative officer over Philadelphia. And he did use uh, uh, public trans uh, wagons that were owned by the state of Pennsylvania to transport his own stuff and um, dealt in ways that people felt were self-dealing. And he was brought up on charges of that. He got a mild reprimand from Washington for it. He didn't like it, but uh, that's that's the way they felt about it. But I think one of to me one of the things that kind of undermined that the, the undermined that uh, idea that it was the money was very very important for Arnold. I think money was important, but it was he was not a he was not obsessed with money. And even after he started plotting with the British to go over to their side, he was giving money to the children of Joseph Warren, who he had met very, very quite briefly on the way to uh, Ticonderoga. Joseph Warren was killed at uh, the Battle Bunker Hill, and he was a, had been a widower, so his children were orphans. And Arnold didn't think Congress was doing enough for those children, and he gave his own money to them to support their education. So it wasn't, seemed to me, the act of somebody who was just totally obsessed with money. So that's the answer to that one. Thank you. 
Great, I'm gonna ask another question from Harold on Zoom. Yes, did the British consider Benedict Arnold a hero? Um, not exactly. He when he went over to England, he they got a very mixed reception. Sometimes they were uh, he and Peggy were hissed when they went to the theater. A lot of the British military people hated him because the combination of the fact he was a traitor, and even though they come he'd come over to their side, nobody likes a traitor, and also the fact that he'd killed so many British soldiers and and his his. Um, can, uh, career as an American officer. So he wanted, he he had found a gift that he had for military life, and he wanted to get back into military life. He wanted to be an active military service in the British. And he tried and tried and tried, and they always opposed, the officers said, we don't want him. And he was never able to do that. That was one of the things that was really frustrating for him uh, during the years he lived in both in England and they were, came over to Canada for a while. Uh, but eventually he got back into uh, just a, a merchant trading. Is there any tangible proof on how the relationship uh, was established between Major Andre um, and uh, Benedict Arnold? Uh, was there a, a middle person involved or? Yeah, there, there, there was a gentleman from Philadelphia. There was quite a bit of back and forth. The British took Philadelphia in 1777, then gave it up in 1778, and their headquarters was always in New York. And there was quite a bit of back and forth between Philadelphia and New York, even though they were on opposite sides of the, the line. Um, people would get passes to go and visit relatives. They get passes to do some business and... And so Arnold gave a pass to a, a merchant from Philadelphia that he trusted, who was a loyalist, and said uh, to make contact with um, Major Andre, and they would that that started their their correspondence. They used invisible ink and all the things you read about in the spy novels uh, to communicate. Uh, and they negotiated for about 16 months. It wasn't an instantaneous thing. It was uh, in 1779, Arnold made contact. He could have called it off along the way. He hadn't really done much, but it built up until finally he culminated the thing at uh, West Point. I think you've touched on this a little bit. Judith asks, what happened to his wife and children? Yeah, Peggy, uh, uh, on her own, you know, wanted to accompany him, went over to uh, England, and um, they had five children of their own, I think, and in addition to his three boys that he had with his first wife. His first wife had died right after the capture of Saratoga, of, of uh, Ticonderoga. So um, Peggy stayed loyal to him, uh, she was left alone. Uh, he was he would go out sailing for months at a time and uh, out on business. And she held down the fort at, at their home and um, stayed loyal to him for the rest of his of his life. And she died a short time after him, even though she was much younger than he was. Uh, she died. Both of them were in early part of the eighteen hundreds. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, do you think that the time in Philadelphia uh, was uh, preeminent in the influences that caused him to be a traitor? That after all, that's where he de determined to get the West Point Association. That's where he was constantly putting out fires between uh, rebels and loyalists. Uh, that's where uh, this uh, economic, uh, you know, get rich quick scheme backfired on him. I mean, it seems like we don't know why, but we certainly know where this all happened. Yeah, so I would agree with that. Uh, people say, you know, George Washington, one of his great um, talents was picking talent. He knew where to t uh, uh, to recognize talent in somebody and where to place them to get the most use of it. And, but he made one big mistake, and that was 
putting Benedict Arnold into Philadelphia. And it had been the truth, uh, true of Benedict Arnold throughout his career. When he was in action, he was golden. He would like he could do no wrong. When he was idle, he constantly rubbed people the wrong way. He he did not he did not get along with people. He was not diplomatic. And um, I think that that everything you said about him was was true. And Philadelphia was was the time when he sort of drifted and spent too much time thinking and and just lost his connection somehow to the to the cause. Take another question from Zoom. This person asks, do you believe that Peggy Shippen may have had an intimate relationship with Andre? Well, um, no. It, it, it would be it would be great if she did, I guess. I don't know. That's been speculated about. I think uh, that was there was a, a, a pretty good Revolutionary War thing uh, series called Turn, which they had Benedict Arnold and I think Peggy was involved in there. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think that's it's it's pure speculation. They were friends. There's no question about that. And then they did send letters back and forth. Um, there was a some rumor that um, Major Andre was gay and that uh, he he had a, a relationship with Henry Clinton, who was the uh, the head of all British operations. He did advance pretty quickly uh, for a young man. So um, <laughs> that's uh, it's hidden in the smoke of history, I guess you'd have to say. Thank you very much for the lecture, sir. Um, tell me more about how he got his wealth. What business that he had that generally is going to be so generous to to uh, pay for the soldiers and pay for other people that were harmed? And um, did the British ever pay him what they promised him? Yeah, he did get paid by the British. Uh, he, he They had agreed to 20,000 pounds, which was a huge amount of money in, in those days if he could hand over West Point, but of course he didn't hand over West Point. So that, that was reduced down to, I think, 6,000 pounds. Peggy also got a stipend for her contribution from the British government. All his sons were given military commissions, which were very valuable in those days. And, um, and the first part of your question was... How did he get his book? Oh, how he made his book. Uh, his um, father had been in the trading business uh, to the West Indies. Uh, he, his father's had his father's business actually collapsed because his father was an alcoholic, and Benedict Arnold had to become a a um, uh, the, like an apprentice to a what was called a an apothecary business, but it's that does not really. I'll give the clear picture of it. It was, a, it was an international trading business and uh, his mother's relatives ran. And he himself set up the similar thing. He had an apothecary shop, which in those days was like a high-end um, goods shop. It sold books and writing paper and so forth and medicine. But it wasn't just a drugstore. But his main money came from trading down to the West Indies, and they would uh, trade in all kinds of things. As I learned more about the American history, several times now I've heard how the Congress um, has not uh, fulfilled their obligation to people and, and the causes in the sense of uh, funding. They were always seeming to try and cheat. Well, they had no tax power. So that they had to find the money somewhere without taxing anything. Uh, they they were always short of money. I, I I'm not sympathetic to Congress. I think Congress made a lot of mistakes during the Revolutionary War, and particularly in their treatment of the soldiers. But it was difficult. You know, it was John Adams was basically the Secretary of War. He held that position along with 20 other committees that he was on and was trying to run the whole thing single-handedly. Usually there was only about five or six congressmen there when they were in session. They didn't have very many people show up and they had to do everything. So it was tough for him. They were very afraid of the army. They were because the army was the only other institution in the, in the colonies that was 
and they were afraid the army would take over. So they wanted to keep them, you know, that's why they wanted to control the promotions. They wanted to keep the army uh, uh, under a tight grip so that they didn't, as had been seen many times in history, the military takes over. So it was, it was a very complicated situation for that. So we're going to take one more audience question so that we leave some time for book signing as well. So I'm going to ask you. Hi, thank you again. Um, did, did the American government try to go after him after the war or did they just let him be? Before the war was over, when uh, Arnold uh, was in New York City uh, getting ready to lead a loyalist uh, battalion down in Virginia, which he did, George Washington really wanted to get his hands on him. And he sent a, a spy into New York and they had a pretty good plot to, to capture uh, Arnold and take him over to New Jersey. And uh, the day the day that it was gonna come off, uh, he took his regiment onto a ship and went down to Virginia. So that fell through. And after that, they never had a chance again. So he lived until 1801. couple announcements here, so I'm just going to sneak in. All right, so thank you so much, Mr. Kelly, for that presentation. Thank all of you for joining us tonight, both in person and virtually. And if you enjoyed tonight's lecture and would like to stay up to date with all of our programs, you can join our mailing list. You just go to francistavernmuseum.org. That's also where you can find our calendar of upcoming programs. Our next lecture will be on Monday, April 8th, same time, same place. And we also have scheduled walking tours on Saturdays in April 13th and April 20th as well. Thank you to those of you who have donated to the museum. Your generous support helps us fulfill our mission and share the history of the American Revolutionary Era with the public. If you would like to donate, you can also do that on our website, francistavernmuseum.org. Thank you again for joining us at another Francis Tavern Museum lecture, and we hope to see you again soon. Yeah, I